this one's got a huge bio. <laughs> um, so uh, our next speaker, I think most people know, is uh, Dr. Silvio Cesare, the Managing Director of InfoSect. He's worked in technical roles and been involved in computer security for over 20 years. Um, including working in Silicon Valley in the US and working in France and of course, Australia. Uh, he's worked in defensive and offensive roles, reported hundreds of software bugs and vulnerabilities in operating system kernels. Um, he used to work at UNSW Canberra Cyber. He's worked as the scanner architect and C developer at Qualys. Uh, he is the co-founder of B-Sides Canberra and C-Sides. Um, he has a PhD from Deakin University uh, a four-time Black Hat speaker, done uh, academic research commercialization, and authored a book. It was a well done, Sylvia. <laughs> Very long out bio. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's, so, it's much shorter when you write it out, actually. <laughs> um, so Sylvia will be speaking next about um, uh, heap allocators. Okay, I'll share my screen and I'll, mm -hmm, yep. I'll get it going. And ensure you're not on mute. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the demo. That's the live demo, not being on mute. Yeah, okay, that's right. Cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, attending virtually the first Seasides, and I hope that you enjoyed um, Dan's talk, and I hope you enjoy my talk as well. And I'm talking about attacks against secure heap allocators. So, memory corruption. I mean. It's been the death of memory corruption every year for the past 15 years. It's still a very common bug in systems software. Um, exploit mitigation certainly in the past you know, 15 or 20 years have made exploitation less common than they used to be when everything was pretty much exploitable. And you know, like I said, over the past 15 years, you know, mitigations have increasingly raised the bar uh, to actually deliver a working exploit. Um, heap allocators, those things that are responsible for dynamic memory management, have likewise also become more hardened and more secure. So we've certainly seen a lot of mitigations in the past 15 years with a very early um, um, safe um, unlinking uh, in, in, in PT malloc to, to where we are today with, with many hardening techniques. So this talk will look at some of the heap hardening techniques in secure allocators and look at attacks against them and how to bypass them. So I'm going to talk about five things. I actually said four things in my abstract, but I'm going to actually talk about five things. I'm going to talk about pointer guard in glibc, which is the Linux default standard C library implementation for glibc. It's not really a heap allocator, but it's very much related to uh, protecting pointers and memory on the heap. So well, not always on the heap, but protecting memory and pointers. And it's very related to the other attacks that I'll talk about. I'll talk about the Linux kernel's default heap allocator, which is known as the slub allocator. That's the default Linux kernel allocator. I'll talk about a hardened allocator called ISO alloc. I'll go back to the slub allocator because I've got another attack that I want to talk about. And then finally, I'll end up talking about the scudo allocator, which is the allocator used in Android user land. So quite a few allocators. And I'll talk about individual attacks against each one of these allocators. So we'll start off with pointer guard in GNU libc. Now, pointer guard is actually a mitigation. Uh, it's a mitigation technique in glibc that they call pointer guard that protects against pointer corruption. So if you have a pointer and there's memory corruption and the memory corruption the attacker overwrites that pointer with something that they're choosing, pointer guard is meant to protect against that. So you can't arbitrarily corrupt pointers and make them do other things. There are other techniques on other architectures. iOS has Pointer authentication and things like that. That might be a, another sort of uh, method to do this type of uh, pointer protection. Uh, but pointer guard effectively works by scrambling the pointer before it's stored in memory. Okay, and then when the pointer is used, it descrambles it, and it uses an internal secret that it scrambles it with. So and you're not meant to easily be able to get this secret. Uh, from an attacker's point of view. It's actually part of thread local storage. So you can't really easily access it, this secret that is used in this scrambling operation. Now, pointer guard mostly focuses on function pointers. That's typically what it protects. Uh, it doesn't protect all the pointers in glibc. It pretty much just protects um, most of the function pointers. Not all the function pointers. You still have plain text function pointers in a process image like malloc hooks. 
but we won't talk about that. And the idea of protecting functional pointers with pointer guard is that it mitigates control flow hijacking attacks. So if an attacker overwrites a function pointer, points, you know, points to the beginning of their rock chain or their stack pivot, or points to some sort of thing that executes code, well, pointer guard protects against that. It protects against an arbitrary write to memory that an attacker would be able to use to override a function pointer with their arbitrary pointer. Now, if you start looking at the glibc sources, you'll see a bunch of references to pointer mangle and pointer demangle. It's sort of pseudocode that I've shown here, but um, this is sort of what it looks like, pointer mangle and pointer demangle. And the way that pointer guard works is the scrambling operation works by XORing the pointer with a secret. That secret is stored in thread local storage. And then it performs a bitwise left rotation of hex 11 bits. So that's, that's the scrambling operation. So XOR with the secret and then rotate it. And demangling is the reverse of that. Now, the, the sort of the crux of this, uh, this mitigation is if the attacker knows the secret that the scrambling operation works with, then the attacker wins. They can mangle, an attacker can mangle and demangle arbitrary pointers whenever they want, providing they have you know, an arbitrary write up of memory corruption. But we're attacking this mitigation pointer guard. So the idea is to get the secret. Now, if you just rep again through glibc, you can start to see where pointer mangling is used. And there's one particular interesting case in the pthreads initialization code, which I'll show in this slide here. Hopefully you can read that. And it basically says that in pthread, libc pthread init, which is some pthreads initialization code, there's pointer mangling happening with a function pointer table. Okay, there's a function pointer table that's passed to this initialization routine, and then there's pointer mangling occurring on each of those function pointers. Now, the thing that can, you can defeat pointer guard with is, well, if you know uh, what pointer is being mangled, the address of the pointer that's being mangled, you can recover the secret. And in fact, in part of this pthreads function pointer table, we definitely know which function is being mangled, which, uh, which, which function pointer is being mangled. And if we have a libc base leak, then we know where that is in memory so we can reveal the secret. So that's what we need. We need an info leak to get the libc base. And then we simply say, well, it's, we just take the address of this pthread after destroy function and we can recover the secret from pointer guard. So that reveals the secret because we have a fixed, we have, we have a function pointer that we know about and we know the actual address of that. It's not random. It's a well-known address. It's, it's almost like plain text. Now, if we can make this attack a bit more interesting, in fact, let's wonder, let's, let's have a question now. Are there any cases in glibc where it tries to mangle a null pointer or another constant like negative one? Okay, so is there a fixed constant that's getting mangled by pointer guard? And it turns out as part of that pthread initialization code, the first item or the second item in this array, there's a null pointer and that gets mangled. So this is some known plain text. This is a constant that is being mangled. And from that, we can simply rotate our sort of mangled pointer and recover the secret. And we can, we can defeat pointer guard like that if we have the ability to get an arbitrary read and memory. So we need an info leak. But you know, that's okay. We're talking about memory corruption attacks. And all of these mitigations assume that an attacker is able to corrupt memory and do sort of nefarious things in memory. And it's trying to mitigate uh, the extent of what they can do. So this type of defeat is known as a sort of a known plain text attack. Uh, there's pointer mangling of a null pointer and we can recover the secret. It's almost in plain text to begin with. So that's pointer guard. That's an attack on pointer guard. Um, and really you shouldn't be mangling these constants. Um, you know, it's sort of, you know, pretty easy to recover the secret if it is. The next thing I'll look at is Linux kernel heap allocator, the default allocator known as the slub allocator. And the slub allocator uses uh, what's known as free lists. And free lists are chunks of memory that are free, that are part of linked lists, part of these free lists so that they can later be recycled when the allocator requests memory. So this is why free lists exist. So the allocator can recycle a free chunk of memory without asking system memory for something. 
So there's a well-known heat corruption technique known as free list poisoning. And it basically says, you've got this free list and you've got these linked lists and these pointers in this linked list. If you corrupt one of these pointers and make it point to an arbitrary address, well, when the allocator recycles these chunks, it'll return to you a malloc, an allocated malloc buffer with the arbitrary address that you poisoned or corrupted the pointer in that free list linked list. So that's, that's called free list poisoning. Now, you can actually turn this into an arbitrary write primitive from an, from an attacker point of view. If you have application logic that writes attacker controlled data to an allocated buffer and you make that allocated buffer point to an arbitrary location, that's basically the same as a write what where on an arbitrary write primitive. So that's a very powerful primitive and many heap exploitation techniques work around that principle. Now, historically, you could actually do free list poisoning sort of trivially in, in the Linux kernel heap allocator. But some years ago, in 2017, I believe, so not that many years ago, they introduced a configuration option to make free list hardening uh, as a mitigation. And so they've got this code here. Um, and there's actually a patch that mitigates against sort of this classic naive free list poisoning attack, which simply overwrites one of these pointers with an arbitrary address that will be returned by the kernel allocator. And the, 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 the key, the scrambling function that they use, they have sort of, the, they're sort of the same thing. It's pointer mangling or demangling. They use a scrambling function, which takes the pointer, XORs that against a secret, and then XORs that against the address of the pointer. And our attack, we want to reveal the secret. This is what we want to get. We want to reveal that secret so that we can hopefully craft our own uh, fake corrupt pointers and make the kernel memory allocator return an arbitrary address. Now, the insight of this attack is that in the Linux kernel, pointer and pointer address pretty much belong to the same region of memory. So they're almost bitwise identical. And because you have that XOR identity where you XOR something with itself equals zero, you basically come to the situation where you have pointer XOR with almost itself, which comes to zero XOR with the secret thus revealing the secret. So in fact, the stored pointer in the free list, in these free list pointers, is actually the secret stored as plain text. And if we look at the kernel memory allocator, and this was actually done by Case Cook, an analysis after I did a blog post on it, and he sort of went to patch this particular problem. If we look at the stored value that's stored in that free list pointer, it's almost identical to the secret value that is not meant to be known uh, you know, to an attacker or, or be plain text in memory. So the Linux kernel team acknowledged this as a weakness and they wrote a patch to improve the security. Um, I've actually got my blog post on Linux kernel commit where they, where they talk about this. Uh, and now they use uh, sort of a variation on that scrambling technique, this pointer obfuscation technique. They take the pointer, they XOR it with the secret and then they XOR it with a Endian swap of the pointer address. So they simply added that Indian swap, that swab 64. And this is actually much stronger. It's actually a much stronger, uh, it's, it's much stronger mitigation and much harder to, to corrupt that pointer and make it you know, do what you want it to do. So that's the attack on the next kernel heap. The next allocator that I want to look at is called ISO alloc. And ISO alloc is a hardened allocator with many security mitigations. It's actually a very good allocator. Um, now, they actually use a similar strategy to the Linux kernel slub allocator. In fact, they take the pointer, they XOR it against a secret, and they XOR it against the pointer's address. And I've been told, and I sort of can't verify this, that this sort of pattern actually came from GR security, where apparently this uh, bug, at least, or this weakness existed uh, certainly, at least until uh, I wrote a blog article about it. But let's look at the code in ISO alloc. And we can actually see that there's this um, canary value, which takes this big pointer, XORs it against uh, this address, and then XORs it against a secret. And in fact, when we print the value of uh, the stored value and the secret, all the high bytes are the same. So this is actually an identical class of bug that we saw in a Linux kernel heap allocator, exactly the same bug. Uh, 
it's, it's you know, taking you know, a pointer XOR here with a pointer address bitwise identical may become zero, thus revealing the secret in memory. So very interesting that we saw multiple allocators that have been hardened against point frameless poisoning have this same class of bug or this same class of weakness. So the, I emailed the author of ISO Alloc and he acknowledged that was a weakness. And I recommended to do the same thing that the Linux kernel patch did. Simply use that NDM swap or that byte order swap. And uh, ISO Alloc implemented that change in less than a week after the initial report. And uh, currently uh, it's, it, it is patched much like the Linux kernel patch that I talked about earlier. So is that the end of attacking the Linux kernel heap allocator and ISO alloc? Is there anything we can do that, you know, that, that we haven't talked about? You know, are there any other attacks? You know, is freeless poisoning dead? Now, this is sort of a, a theoretical attack. So it gets a bit out there, I think. It's a bit sort of, it's, a, it's certainly more a, a more exotic attack than the earlier attacks. Now, in cryptography, there's a set of attacks known as bit flipping attacks. And in blip flipping attacks, you basically take some ciphertext, which you know the plain text of, and then you flip some bits in the ciphertext so that it decrypts to whatever you want. And you can actually do that. You can modify the ciphertext, given that you know the plain text, and when you know, the, you know, the victim decrypts the data, it decrypts to what the attacker wants. That's called bit flipping. And it turns out that in theory, we can perform a similar attack on the Linux kernel heap allocator. So there's actually some code in the Linux kernel. It's unusual code and it basically says, and you certainly, you, you, you need some you know, permissions in the kernel to do this. You need some k pointer restrict permissions to do this. So it's not really on by default, but it is there in the kernel. There's some Linux kernel code that says when it tries to look at this free list pointer, it checks to see if it's a valid pointer. And if it isn't, then it, warns you, gives an error and says the free pointer, this free list pointer is corrupt. And then it also prints what it decoded to or demangled to, okay? So it's a pointer demangling oracle. We can basically pass arbitrary corrupt pointers to our free list and that demangle operation or that pointer deobfuscation operation, we can actually see what it comes to. So this is the attack that we're gonna do, or at least in theory, this is sort of a theoretical attack. Uh, with some sort of verification, but it's theoretical really. So we'll take a free list pointer and we've got memory corruption. So we're gonna corrupt that free list pointer with the value of our choosing, okay? Then we're gonna get the allocator to demangle using our demangling oracle and we're gonna note the result. Given only that, that we've got a demangled pointer from a pointer that we sort of corrupted we can do a bit flipping attack and using that, we can corrupt the free list pointer again, making it to the mangle to an arbitrary address of our choosing. So that's a bit flipping attack applied to the Linux kernel heap allocator. And to do this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna corrupt the free list pointer with the value. And we're just gonna corrupt it with the value one. And we choose one, not zero because uh, zero has a very special meaning. It's a null pointer, so it might sort of be sort of not work well, it might terminate lists or so forth. But one is probably a safe thing. Okay, so we're going to corrupt this free list pointer with one. And then we're going to use our demangling oracle to tell us what it demangled to. And we're going to call that pointer one. Now we've got another chance at corrupting the same free list pointer. And we're going to take our target address, XOR that with one, and XOR that with what our demangling oracle gave us. And this is our obfuscated pointer two. We're gonna corrupt the free list pointer with that. And guess what? When the kernel tries to demangle that pointer, it actually gives you the target address. So it's a bit flipping attack. And I've got a, like a small proof here showing the, the sequence of XOR operations so that you get your target address out of it. But basically we need to corrupt the free list pointer with the value of our choosing use our demangling oracle and then re-corrupt the pointer and we can make it demangle to any target address that we want. So it's a bit flipping attack. It's a theoretical attack. Certainly sort of with test starter it works, uh, but it's interesting that such an attack might be possible. You know, learning cryptography might actually be useful even to people doing memory corruption. 
The final attack that I'm going to look at is the SCUDO allocator. And SCUDO is a hardened allocator written and maintained by Google. Okay, It's used in the Android user lens so on mobile devices. It's very easy to use to compile and you just use CLang and you pass that sanitizer with SCUDO and it uses a SCUDO heap allocator. Now SCUDO does, is a secure allocator, tries to mitigate against memory corruption. And one of the things that it does to mitigate against memory corruption is that it puts checksums into malloc chunk headers in an attempt to prevent an attacker from forging their own fake chunks. You can't pass to free a fake chunk because there's a checksum on the header that uses an internal secret and a CRC32 checksum algorithm uh, to calculate that checksum. So there's a secret that a cookie, a 32 bits cookie that we don't know about as an attacker that prevents us from arbitrarily creating our own checksums. Only the allocator knows this, this, this cookie. And it uses a, a CRC32 algorithm, sort of a common checksum algorithm involving that secret, involving the original chunk header, um, you know, sort of in a pseudo header, and then it writes that new checksum to the chunk header. So what we want to do ultimately, we want to fake checksums. Okay, we want to create fake checksums. And we also want that secret cookie. And what we're going to do is represent this secure checksum algorithm, including that secret value, as a set of SNT equations. So a set of constraints. And we're going to assume that we have an info leak, or we're able to read one chunk header of a, of a valid chunk. Okay. So we have an info leak. We're able to read a chunk header. We're going to represent the checksum algorithm involving this secret cookie as a set of SNT equations. And then we're going to ask a solver to see if it can compute a solution for the secret cookie. And if it does actually do this, well, we can craft correct chuck checksums on fake headers using this secret cookie. And this is a set of SNT equations represented in Python a Z tree. And that's enough to represent the checksum algorithm. It only does a CRC32 checksum only on a few bytes, really. It's not an arbitrary length amount of data. So it's actually possible to represent this quite effectively as a set of equations. Now we can ask our SMT solver, can we solve a solution to give us that cookie value, that secret cookie value? And in fact, we do get a solution in you know, very quickly in less than a second. And it's one of many solutions that it gives us. And the solution that we get it's not actually going to be the real cookie. Okay, there's many solutions that it sort of can solve um, that make that checksum valid, but it's not you know the real cookie that's used by the system. But it turns out it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's not the real cookie because there are secret cookie collisions. And in fact, the secret cookies that we determine or compute are good enough to build correct checksums for arbitrary fake chunks. So, you know, again, what, you know, what does a fake chunk give us? You know, why are we trying to forge chunks or build fake chunks? Well, in many allocators, if you corrupt the size field in a chunk header, you can free that chunk and it goes into the wrong size free list or bin. And you can make the allocator believe that that chunk or that chunk header represents is much larger than what it is. That chunk that it belongs to is much larger. So a future allocation that's quite large uses that chunk, even though it's much smaller. And in fact, that allocation overlaps because it's thinking that it's much bigger than it is. It overlaps an adjacent chunk to the original chunk. And an attacker can corrupt critical data structures, overwrite function pointers, or pointers themselves, and do other things as well. Future work is to see if such attacks are possible on SCUDO using these fake chunk headers. But you know, it's pretty good. You can craft your own fake chunks given only one info link. So that's it. So I presented a number of attacks against hardened allocators. The mitigations in these allocators all assume an attacker is able to corrupt memory. So I'm not, you know, so this is the basis. You know, you can corrupt memory. You, can, you know, you've got some primitives. What can you do with the allocator? And can you bypass some of the mitigations 
and defences that they implement to prevent or mitigate against exploitation. And it turns out we can actually do a number of attacks against a number of hardened allocators and bypass a bunch of mitigations. So that's pretty much it. Um, my Twitter name is there. I also do training at InfoSec. That's sort of my full-time job. Uh, I do courses on code review and heap exploitation. Check out the website or ask me uh, some questions in the Slack and I'll be happy to take them. Awesome, that's great. Can you play the clapping, Sylvia, for yourself? <laughs> Ah, great, great, great. Um, so there are a few comments on, on uh, Slack. Uh, Sniff wanted you to know that we can hear you up the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, that's important. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we had one question was uh, about when you were talking about um, scrambling. <laughs> um, is that the same as encryption? Yeah, so... so it, it is an attempt to sort of to, um, it, it is trying to do encryption. It's not cryptographically secure scrambling. And I use the word scrambling in semi encryption because in these particular cases, you know, the goal is for the, these allocators to be very fast and they really just want a scrambling operation. They're not really cryptographically secure operations. And that's why I'm using the word scrambling instead of encryption. But, you know, in one sense, you know, it is trying, to sort of an encryption or a hash or something, you know, it's trying to be, you know, add a little element of, um, you know, having a secret and not revealing it. But they're not really encryption; they're really more scrambling. Mm. You know, real cryptography. Yeah, awesome. Um, Caitlin also observed that you did list your Twitter handle before your actual full-time job. So it was interesting to see the importance you placed on Twitter versus <laughs> your job, which <laughs> is quite funny. Um, that's great. I mean, come come onto the Seaside's channel afterwards. I'm sure people have, have questions. Um, it's always great hearing about your research into the, in, in, into the heap allocator and other things. So I guess this, that, that ends our, um, our two presentations for tonight. Um, we did promise we'll do some uh, a breakdown.